We, the Center for Global Development, we're a group that try and see how we can make the international system that supports global development work more effectively. How do we finance infrastructure in the poorest parts of the world? How do we increase productivity in agriculture? What kind of policy brings out the best outcomes? What CGD is about is you can ask those difficult questions that people refuse to ask and actually find solutions. We're thinking about how climate change will impact migration patterns, how that will in turn have impacts on people's health. It's challenging to be able to align budget with ambitious programmatic goals, but it can be done. If you can help to make things a little bit better, that's a good way to spend your time. Greetings. Well, welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome to Kristalina Georgieva, Managing Director of the IMF. It's uh, always a pleasure to have you back at CGD, and uh, right now even more so on the eve of the spring meetings coming up, mm -hmm. and uh, you're just back from a trip to China. We were just talking about it. We'll have a chance to talk about a lot of these things. And before I start, I just want to remind, we have a lot of people watching this virtually. So I want to remind all of you who are watching uh, virtually that you can send in questions if you do have any. You can send them in by email or uh, to uh, events at uh, cgdev, that's cgdev.org, or on the YouTube channel you're watching this on, or on Twitter. So any of those ways will hopefully reach us in time. And I'm <laughs> sure there are people in the audience sitting here who will have questions too. So. Before we get to the questions, I have a few questions <laughs> of my own that I wanted to get to. But first of all, welcome, Kristalina. As I said, it's always a great pleasure to have you here. Wonderful to join you. <laughs> so thank you for the invitation. And uh, let, let, you know, I want to start by, I don't know how many of you uh, had a chance to, to look at this, but uh, uh, the Managing Director of the IMF did a speech at uh, King's College at Cambridge about two weeks ago now. And uh, it was a speech which was sort of the economic prospects for my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of you will remember that title from somebody <laughs> else who made a very similar uh, paper many, many year, decades ago. And uh, harking back in a way to the spirit of that paper by, by mm -hmm. Keynes, uh, you also looked in that speech at sort of the prospects for the next 100 years. and, and uh, you drew out uh, two scenarios, uh, one of which would see sort of per capita income living standards double uh, over the next 100 years, and the other would see them increase almost tenfold, uh, depending on uh, how the world organized itself between over the coming decades uh, on, on the new challenges we face. And I thought that was a very nice framing and, and then now I thought today we could come back a little bit. Uh, I'm a more modest man, so, so I tend to look at the next decade. You know, it's sort of, so, well, what are the prospects for the next decade? And, and I want to get a little bit your sense to start with, Christina. We were just talking before we came in that you know, in some ways it's so clear what the challenges are. It's so clear what is needed to make progress. But yet, when you look at the numbers, whether it's uh, growth numbers that, mm -hmm. uh, that your own staff uh, put out in the WIO for the World Economic Outlook for the next uh, five years, or investment numbers, and without investment, there's not going to be any growth, or you look at financial flow numbers, and the private sector last year actually took out a, a couple of hundred billion dollars out of mm -hmm. developing countries, and the official sector put in some, but couldn't compensate. So, so. You square all this and you sort of say, well, are we starting off on that lower trajectory that you had? You know, you, you had these two. Uh, are we uh, at the moment sitting close to the bottom of, of your range? How, how do you see the next decade? Then we'll get into more specific stuff. Well, the um, uh, question is uh, exactly right. What would determine whether we are on the lower growth trajectory for the next 100 years or on the high growth trajectory uh, would, de would be determined by three things. First, how technology 
penetrates our economies, how inclusive we are in making it work for everybody. Second, how we make capital work for the best purpose and in the best places. And this is actually where I differ from the um, uh, Keynes writing in which he emphasizes the accumulation of capital, whereas I think today we need to focus on the allocation of capital. Would capital go to the countries where population will increase and there would be this youthful labor force or not? Would it go to the green and digital transformation or not? And these are choices that indeed we have to make with clear head that there are consequences of how we make them. And uh, when I look at today, what makes me lose sleep at night is this low productivity, low growth trajectory for the next years. I uh, remember vividly, I started as managing director in October 2019, just before COVID. I gave my uh, first speech. What was the speech about? Low productivity, anemic growth, and that is still the case after the pandemic. Uh, can we shake it up? Yes, of course we can. It would take determination and it would take something that is currently in uh, insufficient supply and it is the will to cooperate. Uh, and I look at the IMF, I see for us two equally important tasks. One, make sure that we have the financial capacity to operate, support those that most need us. And for the next years, this would be vulnerable middle-income countries and low-income countries. So we have to have the strength for them. Uh, and later I can come to how we build this strength. Two, make sure that we bring our membership together. And despite all the difficulties in cooperation, we, we work towards consensus on those issues on which the future of our children and grandchildren uh, depend. Right. So I, I think that's, that's great. So now let's, let's zoom in a little bit on, on what you've just said. So I'd, I'd focus a bit on the IMF, because and if you take the IMF, well, let's one part is the sort of financing. The other, as you said, is bringing people together. And of course, the financing is accompanied with a set of policies that help countries to do better with their own resources. But on the financing, um, there is a persistent question that people raise, and I think it's good to get your response to, which is, look, you have a big balance sheet. Mm -hmm. And obviously you want to strengthen it, and we'll talk about how it could be strengthened. But when you look at the flows from the IMF to emerging markets, developing countries, you know, last year I think they were slightly negative numbers in terms of when you get the repayments back. But, but they're always fairly small in relation to the potential. And now is the time when countries need that financing. So are there ways in which one could envisage over the next five, seven years an IMF that is a more active financier mm. of emerging markets and developing countries. And also, can we imagine a way in which the IMF is able to respond more effectively to countries as they are hit by shocks? I think this is one of the things that mm. you have made a big point over mm. the last couple of years is that we're going to be living in a more shock-prone world. Uh, so it'd be good to get a little bit your sense of that. And then for the lower income countries, we can talk about mm -hmm. what's holding back the ability to do more, yep. which is in a way yep. the subsidies. So uh, first, uh, we need to recognize that uh, since the pandemic, we have injected $1 trillion in liquidity and 
reserves. $650 billion, uh, the uh, 2021 SDR right. allocation, which is adding financial capacity without adding to debt. Very valuable, especially for the countries that are most uh, distressed because of high uh, debt levels. And th about $360 billion in lending, which went to about 100 countries. Right. Now, we are a lender of last resort. You know that very well. We actually do pre much prefer that we help countries to create conditions for financial flows beyond the uh, IMF. We prefer to see more private sector, domestic and uh, foreign investments in countries. So I would not think of our job is to lend more, but lend as much as necessary to stabilize countries. I will give you a couple of examples. Over the last uh, months, uh, we had, uh, as you know, a very sizable program for Ukraine, uh, over $15 billion. It is an anchor for Ukraine, and it mobilizes $120 billion overall support over four years. We just uh, uh, went to board with uh, augmentation of our Egypt program from three to eight billion. It is significant because it is an anchor for Egypt and multiple sources of financing right. uh, have come. When I look at our uh, role, it is this. Can we anchor a country and can we help it build sound macroeconomic fundamentals that allow for growth to go up? Different story for low-income countries. Right. So we... Different story. In low-income countries, uh, our role today uh, is uh, gen genuinely to provide uh, sometimes life-saving financial resources. And uh, uh, maybe the audience knows, maybe you don't. The fund traditionally for many, many decades was very uh, marginal when it comes down to low-income countries. Our average annual lending was around $1 billion for all low-income countries. Since the pandemic, we have recognized our responsibility to step up. And uh, we have, uh, in the years of the pandemic, uh, we have uh, uh, more than quadrupled financing for low-income countries. We actually created something that I am, for, on behalf of my colleagues at the fund, I'm very proud of we have offered our richer members to lend some of their SDRs to us and through us to direct them to low-income countries and also to address climate vulnerabilities. Our lending capacity for PRGT has expanded significantly. We are now at the point when um, we do not have a problem anymore of lending capacity. Uh, a couple of days ago, the US uh, uh, Congress approved $21 billion loan to PRGT. It comes on top of around 40 billion that we have built right. over time. Now our issue is to guarantee that we have the subsidy resources to bring the cost of our lending to these countries down. At this point, we lent at zero interest rate to low-income countries uh, with the objective to, to be able to do a low-cost lending uh, in the future. Possibly, and we are discussing this with our membership, possibly going more in the direction of the uh, World Bank in which there is some differentiation. Really poor countries, they get grants. We don't have much of, uh, as you know, grant giving capacity, but you could have zero interest. Anyway. Zero interest rates for them. And then maybe a, a, a way below uh, market, 
uh, way below very concessional uh, rate for countries that are in, in better shape. So we can expand our liquidity uh, provision uh, capacity. And I want to say this to the audience. It breaks my heart when I look at what the data tells us about advanced economies, emerging markets and low income countries. It tells us that actually the scarring from the pandemic in advanced economies and emerging markets is much less than we anticipated, we projected some years ago. Why? Because these countries can pump money into the economy and prop it up. For low income countries, today they are on average 10% GDP less than they had before the pandemic. The scarring for them is really significant. So we have this, the, the World Bank is going for IDA, we are going for, for funding our PRGT. I really think that it is in, in the interest of global stability that we are successful uh, in, in getting that funding. So let, I think that, that is clearly a priority for low income countries this year. And, and I, uh, I want to just probe a little bit more on that. So one of the things about the financing of low income countries, as you say, is being able to generate enough subsidy resources mm -hmm. that enable you to bring down the cost of that lending. And, and maybe going forward, won't all be at zero uh, interest mm -hmm. rates. It could be more graduated depending on, on how uh, need, what the needs are for different groups of low income countries. And if I remember right, at Marrakesh, in the annual meetings, there was some discussion about how to generate those subsidy uh -huh. resources. And there's a periodically a question as to, well, doesn't the fund have uh, all this gold sitting there? And, you know, if you could sell 8% of your gold uh, profits on that would be $10 billion. That would be a lot of subsidy resources. And then people say, well, you've got all these surcharges. you billion dollars a year, $2 billion a year that these emerging markets have been paying, going into the fund and sitting there. Your reserves are building up. Why is it so hard to reallocate some of these funds to subsidize the low income lending? And let's move it up to 10 billion a year. You know, the lo so, I, so well, I'm, how I'm do you deal with all of that? I'm with you. So let me, <laughs> let me give you a perspective of how the, uh, the, how the conversation is going. Uh, first, there is a recognition that uh, the fund's role in low income countries is significantly broader and bigger right. today and the membership is prepared to support it for it. Uh, when we were in Marrakesh, uh, miracles happened. Actually, Christine Lagarde, my predecessor, called the Marrakesh uh, meetings the Marrakesh miracle because we got 50% increase in our quotas, right. which is massively better than to rely on borrowed resources. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and actually, our uh, finance team uh, calculated that if we take $1 notes and we line them up, it will go to the moon and partially back this increase of subsidy. And very, very nice right, image. Right, right. That gives us strength for the GRA uh, countries. Right. But the other miracle was that we reached our target for both lending, bo um, um, loan resources, right and subsidy resources on the basis of two things. 41 countries making contributions, some of them for the first time, some of them not rich countries. And that was solidarity in action. Two, we have created an investment account. So some countries put SDRs into this investment account, we invest it, the income is more than the um, uh, interest rate on SDRs. Right. So this income goes into the subsidy account. So that kind of creativity is there. Now, you're asking a very good question. Can the fund do more? And the answer is yes. Now, we have, a, we have started the conversation with the uh, membership on that basis. Uh, in 2011, our membership 
uh, very wisely said, we need to have precautionary balances that are enough to guarantee against any potential losses on our balance sheet. Target 25 billion SDRs. This month, April, we are going to reach the target. What does it mean? It means that with income still being higher because we lent so much over the last years, we can discuss what do we do with this income in excess of our precautionary balances. Now, it is not an easy conversation because there are different interests. There are those who would say, bring the cost on our loans down, right. surcharges. There are those that would say, let's put more money into the subsidy account. And there are those who say, wait a minute, you are telling us the world is more unpredictable and it is shock prone. Let's put more in the precautionary we balances. We can never have enough precautionary balances. We can balance. never have enough. So the, the discussion, I think, is going to be a very constructive discussion. We would come to the annual meetings and I think the world would like where we come. On the gold sales, this is uh, a, a matter of a uh, very strong conviction among some of our members uh, that selling gold is really last resort in case of unanticipated emergency. And we haven't yet gotten to a point when there is enough openness. We have many members who say, let's sell some gold. And there are some that are saying, Wait a minute! Uh, don't don't rush there, but it is on you know on the table. It's a possibility. Now, I, I remember the last time we had the conversation about gold sales, and you know it went through the same process of strong mm. denial mm -hmm. and, and opposition, and ultimately you guys found a compromise. And I'm sure that when the time comes, yes. you will find a compromise. Yes. But yes. what I took away from that segment is that. Between now and the annual meeting, we should be aiming to find, looking for some way in which one could meet all these different, uh, equally legitimate yep. uh, demands for how the additional resources could be used. Just before we move mm -hmm. on financing, one final question, because it's one also mm -hmm. that is out there, people, which is, you talked about the fund being a sort of catalyst for mobilizing other mm -hmm. financing. And obviously, one of the other sources of financing is the Multilateral Development Bank. Mm -hmm. And there are many proposals about how the fund could help the mm -hmm. MDBs. One is, can you provide a backstop facility, et cetera. So let's, let's leave some of the ones that haven't been explored out for the moment. Mm -hmm. But there is one which has been on the table for a couple of years, which is, can one use some of the reallocated mm -hmm. SDRs to provide them as loans to the MDBs uh, in a way that they could use those loans to be quasi-equity and leverage them up. And this has been discussed, and, mm -hmm. and, and I know this has kind of been working its way through the system, and it's mm -hmm. been a somewhat difficult process. So I, I want to just get your sense on where we are and where you think we will end yeah. up on that yeah. in the coming weeks. Well, where we are is that there is a discussion in our board because this is new use right. of SDRs. It has to be approved by our board of directors. Uh, there are quite a number of supporters to go that way. Uh, obviously, they have to be holders of SDRs willing to participate. And it looks like there may be sufficient number of them uh, to create that kind of hybrid uh, capital. Uh, where the uh, difficulty is, and actually this time I would be uh, more amenable to the concerns, central banks think of SDRs as reserve asset. Right. They are still absorbing the fact that we have created $100 billion equivalent of these reserve assets for lending. So now we come and say, oh, well, here is another way to use it. And th they are very, therefore, uh, very good reasons, incredibly cautious. So they're cautious. They're saying, are you sure that you can protect the reserve asset quality of the SDRs? Right. <clears throat> uh, and then comes the uh, question on 
would there be critical mass to secure that reserve quality? Because the way we use it in PRGT and with the creation of the Resilience and Sustainability Trust is we pull SDRs from many countries and on that basis we guarantee to every owner if you want your SDRs, right. you can have it. So it is one of these rare things in life when you can have your cake and eat it <laughs> at the same time. So we have to do the same cake eating but having maneuver for the uh, uh, development which, banks. Which, of course, we've already done for the PRGT completely, and completely. the RST. Yeah. And so my, to answer your question, it is in, in process, and I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, quite uh, um, um, you know, sure that a way, a resolution would be found. Right. Thank you. I know I'm proud to see Mark Plant is sitting here. Yeah, there he is yes. in the last row. Mark Plant is a sort Mark, of go-to go man for, for he everything wrote, to do he with... Wrote, you wrote a great paper. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think that the way you explain to central bankers why they are still going to have their cake uh, was brilliant. Uh, Thank you. And, Thank you, and Mark. And eat it too, twice. All right. Eat it, yes, yes. <laughs> so, and in this case, you eat it and it gets leverage four times. You yeah. eat four times. <laughs> So Never you mind. eat this it and you have three more cakes. <laughs> <laughs> this is becoming a little too. All right. Cakey. <laughs> now, let's move, move from all of that, I think, to another area. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, it's, it's the fund's role in supporting countries dealing with climate change. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have the RST, and that's part of your response. But the fund's role goes much beyond that in terms of looking at the macro and implications of climate change, et cetera. What strikes me is that uh, I think the first time there was a discussion of climate change in a flagship IMF document was 2008. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of 15 years ago. And there's still today, probably, I don't know, maybe in this audience, but certainly in a broader audience, people who think the IMF is doing way too much on climate change and trying to do stuff that it shouldn't be doing. And there are others who think, you know, the IMF is sort of missing in action on mm -hmm. this climate change is such an existential question, you should be doing a whole lot more. And, and you have to sort of, you know, make progress, as they say, cross the river by feeling the stones here. And I want to get a little bit of your sense of, do you think this is now more or less settled? Do you have a sort of consensus path forward? Are we going to be seeing the IMF doing a lot more on climate change? In what ways or pulling back? Well, let, let's first recognize that uh, the, in a world where there are still some who don't believe climate change is real, don't believe it is uh, uh, human uh, impact, it is natural that there would be also right. skepticism for anyone doing anything on right. uh, climate. For the fund, I can say, first, we only do what we are good right. at and what matters to us and we matter to the uh, solution. In the case of climate change, why it matters to us? Because climate shocks are already macro significant. They can wipe out the GDP of a country in one event. And because moving to the new climate economy is an opportunity for growth and for jobs. So we can't ignore it. It is straight in our alley. But it doesn't mean that we can do everything related to climate change. We focus on three things. We look at the impact of climate risks and the presence of climate opportunities, mitigation, adaptation, from the uh, perspective of fiscal policy, monetary policy, <laughs> financial sector policy, the, the areas in which we have competence. Uh, just to make it uh, very uh, simple, we have a lot of competence on subsidies removal. Clearly removing fossil fuel subsidies in a way that, that doesn't harm vulnerable parts of the population is part of the right. mitigation agenda. Very relevant for the fund, the fund is relevant for it. Or climate related financial stability risks. If you have uh, a bank that is concentrated in real estate in very fragile area, obviously uh, this bank is uh, right. a risk. 
And then we look at data. One of the things we do is uh, to provide more uti higher utility data on climate for macro policy decisions. So you can look at uh, carbon intensity, vulnerability to climate shocks in a context of how do you generate more growth and employment. And the third thing we do is uh, we finance policy transformation using the resources of the Resilient Sustainability Trust, again, 42 billion. Here is the interesting part. We created it. When we created it, we didn't know what is going to happen. Would anybody want to borrow from this trust? Today, we have already 18 programs, more than $8 billion committed. And we have about 30 countries on the queue uh, asking for, for it. What does it mean? That countries are interested first in the financial capacity to borrow from that, but, but equally they're interested in what policies they need to put in place to have stronger right. uh, economy. And that is where we, we, are, we, we, we work. What we don't do, we do not do sectoral investment of any kind. We don't look at, uh, like the World Bank would do, into the uh, um, energy efficiency parameters and how they can be changed. This is not what, what uh, we do. And actually, we have fantastic partnership with the World Bank and with other development banks. On They bring that expertise, more granular expertise. We translate it into policy uh, recommendations. Right. And so I to everybody who worries about it, the fund is right-sized <laughs> on climate. <laughs> Okay, and I'm sure there are people still out there who are like, no, 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 you should be doing more. And, and, and I guess the question is, how do yeah. you build a consensus? I from actually what, think, yeah. I mean, um, uh, anybody who knows the um, uh, history of the fund uh, knows that the way the fund builds ability to engage on a particular issue is through Article 4 consultations, through our surveillance. Now that we include in surveillance, mitigation issues for countries that are high emitters, adaptation in vulnerable countries, we are building up this knowledge base. So what you would see in next, in, in the years to come, is that our regular programs would be better informed from the perspective of the macro significance of uh, climate, um, climate change. Yeah. So let, let's just, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that there are going to be people who have questions, but before going to them, let me just take two other areas. One is, uh, is we talked about low productivity mm -hmm. and growth being low. And of course, one of the things people are talking about more and more is, well, what is the potential of using AI mm -hmm. to go to, on to a different productivity trajectory and therefore different growth path. And at the same time, there are people who are saying, well, doesn't AI actually carry with it the risk that it could widen the divide between countries that are able to use it and those that get bypassed and, and, and the growing inequality becomes even more of an issue. How do you see this AI and the interface between that and economic performance currently, and, and also how would it affect the work of the IMF itself? Uh -huh. I mean, do yes. you see yeah. your teams doing the same kind of work, or are mm -hmm. they going to be mostly doing other stuff? Uh, well, um, first the, uh, is, um, uh, to answer your first question, uh, the, the uh, artificial yeah. intelligence uh, can be the big bank that creates uh, uh, tremendous opportunities some that we cannot even imagine today uh, for productivity uh, growth. Uh, no question about it. You just uh, uh, look at some of the applications of artificial intelligence already. Right. You know, you can get uh, um, be driven by your car, so you don't need a chauffeur. Um, the uh, way information can be processed, the way medical treatment can be delivered there, there it is enormous. Uh, we did an assessment of what is the likely impact on labor markets, and it is really um, massive. Over the next years, on average, 
40% of jobs globally would be impacted by artificial intelligence. Some would be enhanced, there would be more productive jobs, many would disappear. In advanced economies, it is 60%. In low-income countries, 26%. And that takes us to your point on inequality. On, you know, 26% of jobs affected in low-income countries may sound like, oh, thank God we are not at that risk of this wave to hit us. But it also means uh, they may be left, uh, left behind. And the risk of growing inequality within countries and across countries is very real. As is the risk of using uh, artificial intelligence for evil, not for good. Uh, we also looked at, we said, okay, how well are countries prepared for right. this new world of artificial intelligence? We created an index that takes into account four things. Digital infrastructure, investment in human capital and labor markets, innovation, and regulation and ethics. So we ranked countries, 175 of them, on the basis of these four indicators. What came as a surprise when we did the ranking is that when you take that kind of comprehensive approach, it is not the US that comes on top. Obviously, if you only look at uh, development of artificial intelligence, uh, the US has the seven, uh, the right. magnificent seven, the US is way ahead. But when you look at how well society is prepared as a whole for it, number one, Singapore, number two, Denmark, number three, US. And what, of course, we need to work on this index, this is our first attempt, but what it tells us is that countries have to take it very seriously and they have to build the ingredients to bake the ingredients yeah. since we are on a cake uh, analogy today uh, so they can actually achieve high productivity high growth in the future uh, and that would be uh, you asked me about the IMF so in the IMF we now have IDA IDA is our artificial intelligence assistant and it's remarkable it's like you're talking to a human being it changes the way we work. I asked the team, there is a cross-departmental team that is working on that, and I said, please define my job in a world of artificial intelligence. So when I see you next time, I'll tell you how it looks like. <laughs> there will be change. There will be quite, there are quite a number of activities at the IMF in which artificial intelligence can play a big role. very big role. Uh, and of course, we also have to think how we prepare our staff for this, I mean, how we transition in a way that is uh, uh, respectful of people's professional standing and dignity. Right. So it's a big job. If, if, if there is anybody in this room who still thinks that we are talking about something 20 years down the road, wake up. All right, so you've got your wake up call. <laughs> now, so the last, that kind of takes me to the last uh, area that I just wanted to get your reaction to, which is artificial intelligence and the governance of artificial intelligence mm -hmm. is one of the big challenges of global cooperation, international cooperation that we face over the next decade. Uh, it's clearly one of the areas where we can't have every country doing its mm -hmm. own governance uh, uh, easily. And in some ways, there are other areas, debt, another area where we need to have some common approaches to make things work better. I, you're just back from China, and, and uh, I wanted to get a little bit your sense of, in, in a world, I mean, the IMF has written a lot about the cost of fragmentation, mm -hmm. and I think I saw a speech by, that Gita gave recently where she talked about the equivalent of the GDP of Germany or something being impacted by, lost through fragmentation. I think Germany comes from- Germany and Japan. Germany, well, there you go. So, uh, uh, and now, I think the question in my mind is, how do you see the creating a zone of cooperation in a world where mm -hmm. fragmentation is more the norm than the exception? Uh, no, no question that we are in a, in a more fragmented right. world. The evidence is very clear. 
you look at uh, trade statistics, uh, what we see is um, uh, trade is increasing slower than GDP, and normally trade is an engine of growth. The number of restrictions has uh, uh, quadrupled in just last couple of years, trade restrictions. Uh, when we look at very interesting data, when we look at trade within and across, let's call them blocks, more, right. you know, countries that come more uh, closely together. It is down in both cases, but of course, more down between. Across. Who is the beneficiary, especially in uh, uh, foreign direct investment? It's a very important message. The beneficiaries are countries that trade with everybody, work with everybody, the Indonesians of this world. My, my view is that uh, the world is now so economically integrated that to completely fragment it, to break it to separate entities as it was in the times of the uh, Cold War is difficult, not impossible, but more difficult. Yeah. And there is enormous role of technology to connect us, which didn't exist in these days. When, we, when I was living on the other side of the Iron Curtain in, in Bulgaria, right. I had no clue how life was here. None. Now we are all in a fishbowl. You see what the others are doing. You aspire uh, to, right. to do better. Exactly. So I don't think we can go that direction short of some very dramatic uh, event, God forbid. What can we do, the IMF? Be very pragmatic. Focus on issues of common interest of our members and bring the membership together. You talked about that. We have a big role to play to bring different entities together. We created together with uh, India as uh, G20 chair and the World Bank, the Global Sovereign Debt Roundtable. What is it? It is a place where traditional creditors, the so-called Paris Club creditors, New creditors, China, India, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, private sector creditors, and they're a big part of the, of the right. uh, uh, credit landscape, and debtor countries, they all sit together. What is the practical outcome of it? Identifying concrete issues where there is disagreement and building common approach to them. For example, uh, disagreement on what is the role of multilateral development banks resolved. Now we are on our way to address the issue of comparability of treatment. Private sector, public sector, same treatment. So I, these are the kinds of things that we can and do and we do do right. to, bring, to bring countries yeah. on, a, on a common uh, position so we can solve problems and uh, have the Marrakesh miracle repeated right. in the future. Great. Okay, let's see now who would like. Can we just raise your hands and then we'll try and take maybe three questions. So I think I saw that hand go up first. <laughs> there was a hand over there and then there's Pledge over here. So I'll do those three first. Thank you so much, Managing Director. My name is Steven. I am an intern at the United Nations Populations Fund. Thank you so much for being here today. I learned so much from this conversation. So I just want to get your reaction a little bit on the, on the term where we say, instead of giving someone fish, we teach uh -huh. them how to fish. Mm -hmm. Right, so I just want to get your reaction a little bit on what is IMF's role in the future in terms of not only serving as a lender of last resort, but also helping low-income countries, helping emerging economies to build capacity through technical assistance or other means. How do you see IMF strike that balance in the future? Thank you very much. Right. Thank you Great very much. Question. Very good question. Is there, yep, over there, please. Hi. Thank you so much, uh, Managing Director. Um, my name is Kate Donald. I work for Oxfam International. Um, uh, I wanted to ask a question about um, the types of policies that the IMF is, is recommending. Um, 
One of the concerns we have is that sometimes in some of the, the loan programs and in the surveillance that the fund recommends um, economic policies that we see as kind of detrimental to tackling inequality and poverty. Mm -hmm. um, and I noticed in a blog recently that some of your colleagues published, um, they very, um, we were very happy to see a very firm statement that this is not a call for austerity. However, they did say, you know, we still need to see substantial fiscal consolidation. So I'd just like to ask mm -hmm. you, where does the fund see the line between substantial fiscal consolidation and austerity? Because I think well, it's really important in terms of how that plays out yep. at the country level. Yep. Yep. Very good question. And the third one there, and then we'll come back to you. No, I think this lady right up here, uh, Jeremy. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah, and I work for the House Financial Services Committee under Ranking Member Waters. Yeah. Um, I recently um, heard from some researchers at William & Mary that there's some evidence that um, China is using escrow accounts to um, basically, like, if they're building a port or something like that, um, have countries yeah. put money into an escrow account so that it doesn't change the amount of debt that they're in technically. Mm -hmm. How are you thinking about that, things like that, and dealing with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. escrow accounts for projects. Yes. So do you want to take those three? And then yeah, we let me take yeah. those three, and if you have some more have time, we'll, more we'll do yeah. more. Uh, Fantastic question. So let me start with the one on uh, helping countries to help themselves. Uh, this is actually what we aspire to do, help countries build strong fundamentals so they don't need to rely on anybody uh, else. How do we do that? We engage with countries and we look at, are they collecting sufficient revenues, especially from the richer part of their population? Are they then investing these revenues for uh, infrastructure, for human capital, efficiently and effectively? Are they creating environment for entrepreneurship that can generate jobs? Uh, and if there is one lesson that I repeat constantly that we learned from the pandemic is that countries with strong fundamentals withstand these shocks much better and of course, they have a better opportunity to grow. We are also looking now into how we help countries to define social protection systems that do not create dependency, but provide a opportunity to grow. Uh, I call this, instead of social safety nets, which is the, no the term we usually uh, use, so you don't fall, social safety ropes or social safety ladders allow, allow uh, like investment in education is a ladder for, uh, for families uh, for the future. Um, the most important lesson of engagement of the fund in country programs is that when countries brave to put their economy on sound footing, they rip off the benefits of it. My own country in the 90s uh, had a IMF program. Um, we had 8,300% inflation before IMF came. It was a very painful period, but as a result, of taking the reforms, the steps necessary. Uh, Bulgaria stabilized, became member of the uh, European Union, and uh, um, uh, income per capita quadrupled in the last uh, uh, decades. So there is that, uh, we uh, don't think of us as, be, we are there and say, here, get this money, squander it, come back again. We want to, to see countries doing well uh, for themselves and their, and their people. Uh, I, I, I really appreciate the question on inequality because there is so much evidence that inequality harms the uh, economies, not only harms people, it harms uh, chances for, uh, for economies to grow. Uh, it was uh, my predecessor, Christine Lagarde, that worked on introducing a policy on social spending floors meaning that in our programs we have to protect education, healthcare, social support. 
And that is a policy that is absolutely central in our work. We do believe that medium-term fiscal consolidation after years of increased spending and increased debt levels is necessary. Otherwise, economies will be crippled. I mean, then you, you have to pay high costs on your servicing your debt. So we believe that is a necessity, but we also recognize that it has to be done with more focus on revenue raising. We did a study, it shows that in emerging markets and developing economies, there can be eight to 9% GDP increase if taxation is uh, put on sound footing. And then of course we want to see uh, quality, of, uh, quality of spending. Uh, de definitely, definitely we don't want the price of fiscal consolidation to be borne by the most vulnerable people in society. And uh, to the question, I mean, the, the most important thing we do together with the World Bank is to, to uh, work on more transparency on that. So we can see who exactly borrows how much from whom under what uh, conditions. And in that sense, uh, we are mindful that, that there could be uh, lending practices uh, that are ultimately detrimental to, to interests of, of, uh, of countries. Uh, and it is something we are discussing, uh, uh, including in that forum that I mentioned, the uh, sovereign debt uh, roundtable. Uh, so yes, it is something that, that we need to be uh, very watchful uh, of. All right, okay, let's take three more questions. So well, I think I had somebody in the front row here, and then I see there's uh, somebody in the back there, and then I'll come to you next. To turn. All right. Oh, thank you, Madam uh, Managing Director. Uh, Christian, still with the Hans Seidel Foundation. Yeah, I'm glad to see you. Um, yeah. My question is, uh, how much are you concerned about the rising uh, US sovereign debt mm. and uh, possible impacts uh, it mm -hmm. might have? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, mm -hmm. US sovereign debt right in the back. Yep, please. Hi, um, Stephen Paduano, PhD candidate at the London School of Economics. Um, so I'm curious about your comments on SDR rechanneling and reserve asset status. And you mentioned uh, this difficulty that in the, in the schemes proposed with the hybrid capital, it wouldn't necessarily have the same encashment as if you were channeling to the RST. And I think when the MDBs hear this, there's some vexation because they have put forward this liquidity support agreement modeled after the RST. Mm -hmm. And they say, why isn't this good enough? So I'm wondering, does that, does that count? Is there a way to improve that? And alternatively, is the problem mm -hmm. just sort of intrinsic to the instrument, the hybrid capital itself? Mm -hmm. And if that were the case, if saying you know partial equity or 100% equity doesn't count as a normal reserve asset, mm -hmm. would you, would the board think differently about a normal debt security denominated in SDRs that the World Bank could issue, mm -hmm. shareholders could purchase, and that would be a new channel for mm -hmm. SDR mm -hmm. channeling? Great, thank you. And then this lady here. Yep. Thank you for taking the question. Malini Patel from Banyan Global. IMF has recognized that gender is macro critical. Yep. I'd love an update on what's happening internally and mm -hmm. what policies are effective. Okay, great. All right, Thank so you. we've got three. I don't think we'll have time for another round, so let's uh, just yeah, let's come get back to you with these three. Uh, so the, uh, uh, f for the US, what we see in the US is uh, uh, the uh, support that has been provided to the economy has propped up uh, the US uh, growth. What is important is that growth in the United States is coupled with increase in productivity not the case in many other countries. So for this reason, we think that the US economy is actually uh, in, a, in a reasonable place. This being said, we tell everybody, watch your debt levels. You have to, you have to take a, a medium term uh, a perspective on how you're going to bring it uh, down because what, what has been done to prop up the economy uh, because of the pandemic cannot be sustained forever, it has to be walked back. And that is, uh, we would have our discussion with US, uh, the Article 4 um, uh, consultation, and that would be one of the issues we will be uh, talking about. But again, when you look at the data, uh, something I didn't talk about, and it is probably worth uh, recognizing, there is quite a significant divergence within advanced economies, within emerging markets, and this divergence is driven by, by multiple factors. Uh, 
how much you rely on import for energy. The U.S. doesn't rely that much. Uh, but one of the, the factors that is very interesting to look at is this difference in productivity. In the U.S., we see uh, wages going up, but productivity going up even, even, even higher. And that is a, that is a good thing for, uh, for the, uh, for the right. economy. Uh, on, the, uh, on the question of um, um, hybrid capital, we have been very supportive of the two development banks that have asked uh, for it. Our technical team in the finance department has worked with them so there can be a uh, robust uh, proposal put to our, our board. My personal sense is the following. It is new. And it is coming new over new over new. So we had the on-lending of SDRs, the creation of the uh, RSF, uh, the use of SDRs for to put in an investment vehicle. Now comes this proposal. It, it takes a bit of time for, for the uh, uh, membership to absorb uh, because they're thinking, are we now doing too much in too many places? Do we need to slow down and uh, first absorb what we have decided uh, before we move forward? I don't think it is a matter of uh, specifically hybrid capital being uh, uh, riskier, but it is something new. You know, hybrid capital is not something that uh, we have supported with uh, SDRs. And uh, as long as there is enough there are enough members who want to do it, holders of SDRs who want to do it, I think we will find a uh, pathway uh, uh, forward. Uh, and on gender, thank you for asking. So uh, amazingly, we are exceeding on our uh, commitments to our board. When we went with the gender stra strategy, we said we are going to do that many uh, countries in which we would look in the, uh, we would put a gender lens in our surveillance. Uh, was it, uh, we, are we 50% above what we promised? Some, so I don't want to, quite to a uh, quite a bit above. What does it mean? It means that teams are interested in doing it. It is not being shoveled <laughs> through their throats. They recognize that uh, labor market participation of women, ability of women to uh, grow up in the ranks, take respons more responsibility. This is really significant from a productivity uh, standpoint. And if you look at what is the difference between our analysis uh, of prospects for growth before when we were a bit more pessimistic and today, it is the strength of labor markets. Women are part of this uh, strength. As for us at the fund, we have now, uh, we went from 25% uh, women in senior positions to uh, 38%. We have for the first time in the top five, me and the deputies, three women, two men, never happened before. And most interesting, I see, I sit in meetings and women, young women speak up. And that to me is hugely, uh, hugely important. Yep, so. Great. Okay, well, that seems to me to be a very positive note on which to end this. No, I want to end with Keynes. Oh, all right. I want to end Let's with Let's go Keynes. back to Keynes. We started with Let's Keynes. Go back. Uh, so Keynes, everybody quotes him for what? In the long run, we are all dead. Actually, we should quote him for, in the long run, almost everything is possible. So I want to right, add right, that exactly. note. So, so that, there we go. In the long run, uh, and I'm kind of hoping that maybe in the not so long run, a few good things will also be possible. Absolutely, so, they will be. So let's, let's move on that. Thank you, uh, Kristalina, for coming. Thank Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Masoud. Thank you to the audience. And thank you also to all of you who joined online. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. Thank you.